Our next panel is What is the Future of Afghanistan? Um, with Peter Bergen and um, Martin Beck, who you will introduce. So, thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, sorry about our technical problems here on Wall College. Um, we'll either fix it or broadcast that particular part of the program at some later date. So, we're very lucky to have Martin Beck here, who was a former chief of staff for uh, President Ghani. Uh, he was in Kabul on August the 15th, 2021, when the Taliban took over. He was in the presidential palace, um, and he was quite surprised when President Ghani suddenly disappeared. Uh, he's also a fellow at New America. Um, and so there are basically three or four questions that we, we, we wanted to discuss. Let's begin perhaps with something that uh, Mateen mentioned to me this morning, which is the National Counterterrorism Center put out a, on September 11th, put out a assessment that Al Qaeda was basically more or less over in Afghanistan, which is uh, very different from an assessment in June. The United Nations said that there were 400 members of Al Qaeda in Afghanistan. Some of them had positions in the Taliban administration. Some of them were collecting welfare payments from the Taliban. Um, so. Mateen, so first of all, uh, what do you think about the claim to two days ago that Al Qaeda was more or less out of business that was put forward by the U.S. government? Uh, first, thank you, Peter, for having me. Uh, I was surprised when I read about the report. Uh, let me elaborate a little bit further. Uh, the report looks sounds to me more politically. Teller, in a way, politically motivated to do with the U.S. cycle of election. So I have worked in the Afghan intelligence service back in 2015, from 2015 until 2017. I was number two in the Afghan intel service in charge of the domestic intel intelligence. So I've worked closely with the um, CIA, MI6, with other agencies, with our partners in Afghanistan actively against the Al-Qaeda and other terror outfit. My perception of, or my impression of the report is that the report is based, uh, first main factor determining this report is uh, the U.S. intelligence community's interaction with the Taliban, with DGI, Director of Intelligence, the Director of Intelligence. Mainly in Doha, it happens. Uh, as far as I know, there has, there's a channel to do with the, when the Doha talk started, this channel was established. So they actively pass, uh, mainly exchange information and also time to time, I assume, uh, there's some intel passes to the Taliban regarding the ISIS-K, like Daesh, Khorasan branch. So the Taliban's claim to the American is that there's a significant reduction in the activity of uh, Daesh in Afghanistan. So the verification mechanism, I believe, is the signal intelligence. And uh, so the signal intelligence, of course, shows a reduction. Why? Um, as anyone who is uh, have a deeper understanding of the Saudi Asia, uh, the terror landscape, knows that the terror outfits there, especially in the past two decades, of American massive reliance on the technology, they know how to avoid signal intelligence or other technical means. Uh, so. My understanding, and also reports from the ground, is that Daesh or ISIS-K, for time being, uh, they are not launching any attack against the Taliban. That's what I've heard from many sources. So there is a reduction. So the talk about it, or the reports we get from the ground, is they are, because recently, after some of high-profile Daesh attack against Taliban, the, Tal uh, the Daesh was under tremendous pressure. And I 
thing. It's more to do with the signal intel, the American past to the Taliban. So now Daesh is kind of reconsidering their modus operandi, and they're going silent for a time being. So that, in a way, that's silent or being a, even some people talk of tactical ceasefire, that shows a reduction of violence. That's second. Uh, so these two factors, maybe if, if someone doesn't have a better understanding of the South Asia, may believe this is real. So that Daesh is not a threat, trust, or it's kind of reduced. Second, on the question of Al-Qaeda, uh, I think it's very naive to assume that Al-Qaeda doesn't have a presence in Afghanistan or doesn't threat, pose a threat uh, to the global security. So just looking, I mean, it doesn't take much time. Just looking at the local media or follow reading news on Pakistan, you will figure out what's going on inside Pakistan right now, how TTP have increased this operation, cross-border operation inside the Pakistan, and that speaks for itself. TTP being the Pakistani Taliban. Exactly, yeah. So, uh, again, my conclusion is, uh, unfortunately, this report or this assessment is more politically motivated. And it doesn't match uh, to the ground reality, first, and second, to the two reports with the UN one in May, as you mentioned, the other one in July, uh, of the analytical support and the sanction monitoring team of the Security Council came out and talked the details about it. Yeah, these UN reports are very thorough and they're based on member states reporting. It's not just the United States assessment, it's many states. And uh, I found them, to, generally speaking, to be the most accurate um, assessment of what's going on, certainly that's available publicly. Okay. And um, in one of the previous reports, the UN said that Siraj Akhani, who's the Minister of the Interior, which is like running DHS, FBI, CIA, is uh, on the leadership council of Al-Qaeda. Of course, the Akhanis have been sort of co-located with Al-Qaeda for decades. So anyway, I'm skeptical of the idea that Al-Qaeda is sort of out of business. Now, on the other hand, um, you know, they haven't announced a new leader. Ayman al-Zawari was killed in July of 2022 in downtown Kabul. Uh, he was living there with the knowledge of Taliban officials, according to the Biden administration, um, which kind of speaks for itself. But the fact that they haven't appointed a new leader, uh, so what, what does that suggest to you? Well, they may have appointed a new leader. They haven't published his name. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think <coughs> for al-Qaeda, I mean, Afghanistan is now a safe haven. And if anyone is, like, let's put us uh, ourselves in their shoes, it would be very stupid to do anything at this moment. It's the best time. I think they're learning from the three decades of presence in the region. They're reorganizing, building their bases, and even reports of new other members relocating inside Afghanistan. And at the same time, uh, they are trying to help this narrative of Taliban's are sticking with the Duhadi. So I think it's a time of consolidation for the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. Um, Al-Qaeda members are in Taliban's uh, intel service, the director of you call GDI, General Director of Intelligence, and a few Afghan members of that Al Qaeda is actively there working, and also some governors, which was in the report highlighted. Uh, my understanding is uh, Afghanistan right now, unfortunately, have turned to a headquarter of terrorism. Yeah. In the short term it would not pose an immediate threat to the United States. It's already posing threat more to the region. Look to Pakistan, already two cross-border attack in Tajikistan, two ISIS-K attack inside Iran originated from Afghanistan. 
So uh, the ground realities or the reports we get from the ground speaks differently. Yeah. The UN report also said there are 20 terrorist groups operating in Afghanistan, which um, I think speaks for itself. Um, and the other thing which is interesting about the UN report is the United States, when it left, uh, the Taliban um, now have 70,000 armored vehicles, more than 100 helicopters. Uh, the UN report suggests there's $8.5 billion of military equipment that was left behind, the Taliban now has. $8.5 billion is more than the defense budget of a lot of European countries. So the Taliban's very well armed. Uh, there is no meaningful armed resistance, I don't think. I mean, obviously you have Ahmed Shah Massoud's son leading the resistance, but he's in Tajikistan. And it seems to me, just as, as an outsider, that the attacks that the, that what the armed resistance is doing is pretty limited to Panjir and isn't really that significant. Uh, am I, what do you think about the armed resistance, they seem to be getting almost no resources from any country. They have some kind of presence in Tajikistan, but this is not like Ahmed Shah Massoud's resistance to the Taliban before 9-11, where he had access to Tajikistan. It, he was also pretty weak by the time 9-11 happened, but he was in the country and he was obviously then, you know, helped we were able to ally with the Northern Alliance and overthrow the Taliban. So, so what's your assessment of the, of, the, of the internal armed resistance to the extent it exists? If we would go a little further before answering this question, I would like to address the Doha deal, which kind of killed any potential armed resistance. So if you see the history of Afghanistan or the region, mainly Afghanistan, most of the, you know, say, regime change or any things in Afghanistan is kind of foreign-driven, in a way. Uh, unfortunately, the Doha deal undermined the Afghan state, which was built by American blood and treasure and Afghan together. There was a counter-terrorism capability in place. Uh, with the Trump administration and with the Biden's, uh, President Biden's announcement of complete withdrawal, kind of give a sense to the Afghan that uh, Taliban is the future. So, in a way, we lost Afghanistan not through a military defeat, mainly through a policy defeat or, or a political defeat. So, this itself killed an arm future armed resistance mm. because Afghans are survivalists you know much better than anyone else they always look the other day when I was talking with a, one of the uh, the freedom fighters this Mujahideen against the, the Soviet he, he said something very interesting to me he uh, said during those days uh, when you would ask uh, and elders in a village, like this, who's in charge of this place? Are you with the Mujahideen or the, the communist regime? The elder would say, whoever controls this area, this hilltop, I'm his subject, in a way. So people are seeing the wind, what the wind of change. Now, the way things have been with the Duha deal, and with the continuous talk with the Taliban, so Afghans are kind of suspicious what's happening. So they, of course, fed off with the Taliban, but they're still seeing what direction United States will take. It doesn't mean United States have to go back in a military way. No, in a political way, what is the big game? What is the bigger decisions? So that's one of the major factor for the armed resistance, any resistance inside the country to pick up first. Second, after August 2021, some of former ANSF members and also some of former Northern Alliance launched some sort of uh, resistance. But uh, of course, uh, it was difficult, as you mentioned earlier, um, uh, logistical support, the weapons, and the way the Taliban came to the power, uh, it's still it's very small. 
and uh, unfortunately uh, it has not been able to politically expand itself. It's become very narrow in a way, uh, but uh, the armed resistance is there. It's not completely died, but as a force is there, beside that, the women of Afghanistan are protesting. There are a lot of other forms of resistance. But mainly, uh, I would say, because I'm in touch with a lot of former ANSF members, tribal elders, and others, they're looking for the, how the wind of politics change in Washington. The reason why I mentioned Washington, Washington is very important because from since 1979, uh, our destiny has been tied with Washington. So uh, uh, I think it's a lot to do with here. And, and the, it, if things are not, if people are not coming up in a massive, protest doesn't work against Taliban. We all know they have like, what sort of regime they are. But people are waiting with what the bigger politics become. Then they will decide. So the Taliban right now, are, you know, they're well entrenched. They don't face any real in internal opposition. They're well armed, but things can change. And so if you go back to December 2011, then Vice President Biden and uh, Tony Blinken negotiated the US withdrawal from Iraq. Three years later, um, Obama sent American troops back into Iraq because first of all, ISIS was threatening genocide against the Yazidis. And then as we heard earlier today, they, kid they kidnapped and murdered Jim Foley and, and other American journalists and aid workers. And there are still 2,500 American troops in Iraq today, which interestingly is exactly the same number of troops that was kind of keeping a lid on things in Afghanistan in uh, the beginning of 2021. So what do you think, you say that Washington is obviously so important to kind of the way Afghanistan uh, and Afghans see the world. What do you think could change realistically? You know, are they just going to be there forever, uh, the Taliban, or are there particular things that could change the politics either in Washington or in the region or in Europe or elsewhere where suddenly uh, this kind of de facto acceptance of the Taliban as the, as the government, even though no government, they're not recognized by any country, but they are in charge. What could change that situation? Well, I, the people talk about many scenarios and uh, the way I see the activities on the ground and the way the Taliban came to the power, uh, Talib itself as an umbrella is a threat to the region and global security. And probably I, what I would suggest be kind of odd, not fashionable in today's global politics, because now it's more about the Bible of a great power competition. But what I see is uh, for the United States and also regional countries um, to work together. So from like the beginning, if I, we go a little bit in the history, of course, Pakistan initially undermined the US presence in Afghanistan for various reasons. After 2010, it was Iran, Russia, China. They start heavily supporting the Taliban. But today, they already see it's becoming a threat. Look, the incident in Pakistan, the activities in the border of Tajikistan, and the attacks inside Iran. And also, which one thing we don't talk is about ETI, Eastern Turkestan Islamic Movement, which is the Uyghurs. And there's a bigger number in the northeast of Afghanistan, where I came from. And from 2014, after the security transition, they were the one who changed the security in favor of Taliban in the Northeast. So they're a threat to China as well. So right now, Taliban's are playing very smartly. It's smartly in a way flirting with the China and Russia, at the same time flirting with the United States. So using, today I was seeing the news, they're given a very red carpet welcome to the new Chinese ambassador. 
definitely, it's, it's very, the message is very clear. They're trying to give a message to the United States. I think we shouldn't be a victim of this sort of uh, play. Uh, now, uh, United States has a lot of expertise on the region. But the good thing is also region is also realizing it's a threat to them as well. So the best way is back, we, come go, we go back to the history after post 9-11, there was a consensus. So on Afghanistan, at least there's a consensus kind of forming again. So the best way is, I think, United States as a state as a leader of free world, also is still as someone uh, shaping the global politics and in the past two decades have invested a lot in Afghanistan. More than one million American military and civilians served in Afghanistan. The veterans are very active. I see, I talk with them on Afghanistan issues. So uh, probably it's ended for certain politicians, but it's not ended for the people. So my suggestion would be uh, before it's becoming too old, I mean, late, it would be good for the United States to lead this and to form a consensus with the region. And on a, before Afghanistan become more descent into chaos in a civil war or this Twitter groups becoming more consolidated, I think United States has to use its leverage. Even Taliban's are desperate for recognition. But but all this has to put a price. Maybe we need a constitutional order in Afghanistan where all the Afghans come together. That could be bring peace and stability in the region, also counter other terror organizations. So probably look idealistic, but it's one of the way forward. Already everyone is talking, United States talking separately. Iran talking separately with the Taliban. Chinese, everyone is doing their own bilateral security things with the Taliban. So what I'm suggesting is maybe something bigger, a consensus, something we have to learn from the fourth decade, if we say the, from 1979 or the past two decades, listen, learn from Afghanistan. Because that region, the terror landscape in Saudi Asia is very fluid. You know it very well than anyone else in this room. How Taliban, Al-Qaeda, even the current leadership of ISIS-K they were former Taliban or former Al-Qaeda. They knew each other very well. So we shouldn't say the threat is not gone. So. Yeah. But so it's the problem, you know, the Taliban is not recognized by any country. And the last time they controlled Afghanistan, they were recognized by three countries, Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, and um, Pakistan. But it's a, I mean, there's a policy dilemma, which is uh, 40 million Afghans, uh, who are, many of whom are close to starvation, there's no jobs, the economy is completely collapsed, um, and the Taliban are the de facto government. So how do you deal with a government? You, you, um, you know, if, whatever you do to help Afghans ultimately is gonna help the Taliban, right? So how, if, you're, you know, if you're a US policymaker, it's tough because there's certain things you do want from the Taliban if you have dual nationals who are in ta Taliban custody, of which I think there are several. Uh, you're trying to negotiate their release. You're also trying to you know, make sure that um, Afghans don't starve. How do you deal with the, with the Taliban in such a way that you're not propping up the regime? It's an interesting question because, um, and also the dilemma exists, we won't talk. Yeah. And, Any, I mean, already the reports are out around 28 million Afghans need human, humanitarian assistance and like life saving. It's, uh, it's, it's, this is one of the biggest humanitarian crises at the moment. Um, the fear, the reason why Afghans are wising of the engagement with the Taliban, like wising their the voices against engaging against the Taliban uh, for reason, because when we look back the story, like Doha deal, what happened? 
and they handed over of Afghan government to the Taliban. Same with Afghans of fear, kind of an engagement or talk with the Taliban might lead in a way to rec their recognition or normalizing their gender apartheid regime, yeah. right? So the, the way forward is very difficult. It's not easy, but uh, even the Doha deal being so flawed, there are, was things inside that could be used for a, for a joint or peace in Afghanistan, something a joint government will emerge from the Republic or the Taliban. So still the Taliban is sticking to that deal. They're saying we're committed to that. So what happens to the inter-Afghan side of it? That could be revived. Second. By uh, whom? Uh, by whom? But by if international community, because they're asking yeah. all the time financial support or recognition. So any legitimate government in Afghanistan should have come out of a process. So one of the processes is this. Yeah. Th that's what I'm saying is the United States has to put this condition because the United States is the signatory of that deal. That's not a popular deal in Afghanistan. But it's better than nothing. There's a framework in place. So that could be used one way. And uh, second, uh, there has been call, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, there's a need for a principle, like principle engage. Why, why the world need to engage with the Taliban? For what? That has to be clear. That engagement only for humanitarian assistance or other things might lead, in a way, normalizing their behavior, which is happening right now. Yeah. So it's better to have a better policy, I think, we have. I, I don't agree with the other, like saying, we don't have many options. There are options still. There are many options on the, on the table. And the other thing, the Taliban, the way I know them, I have been talking with them, and we have fought and talked. Uh, they always think the world, especially the United States, doesn't have a consistent policy. So it will, it will keep changing and keep changing. So they're saying, why we have to change? They will change. And they're right in a way, because the United States, have, since 2001, has kept changing its policy in a way which has benefited the Taliban. I think it's time for us to learn from all those past mistakes. And there is, there is still a way forward to correct the course of action. We, the United States closed this embassy in Afghanistan in 1989 uh, after the Soviets withdrew. That turned out to be a, a mistake. Um, we don't have, the United States doesn't have any kind of diplomatic presence in Afghanistan. I guess it has a, a de facto embassy in Doha and maybe in Uzbekistan. But should the United States re seriously consider reopening its embassy or should other Western countries, I mean, obviously China, Iran, they all have their embassies, Pakistan. Should Western countries open consulates or, some, or if not an embassy, at least have a diplomatic presence? I mean, understanding that that has the danger of normalizing, et cetera. I mean, as the previous speaker, Ambassador, mentioned, like validating the authoritarian regime, sometimes it's, uh, I say jokingly, it's, uh, it's not to be good for, to be too close to America, and also uh, as a big enemy, you know, it's dangerous for you. I think that it's kind of the way you see America has always have a tendency to, you know, punish its own allies mm. uh, and, <laughs> and rewards the enemy. So on that point, that was following his argument, I would say uh, this is the least Afghan expect from, I mean, Afghans already angry with the decision of President Trump and by President Biden. Yeah. And, and uh, United States invested so much in that country. A generation was 
coming up. You know, democracy was flourishing. Women's you were one of those generations. Yeah, you were one yeah, part. Yeah, thousands of us. Like, but I mean, you're you were how old were you on 9/11? I was in ninth grade. Right. So you saw this whole, whole generation come up. It was connected to the outside world. Exactly, and and, and the Afghan was connected, and and I think it was becoming a source of hope. A lot of regional countries was jealous of that. Uh, I think this whole thing shouldn't have ended the way it ended. And uh, we could have still, with a little bit of maturity and patience, uh, a country, two decades of war, like active American presence, you cannot end that in one night, in one year. So negotiation needs patience and also easily, because I was a member of negotiating team. And before that negotiation, before the, uh, the US signing the Doha deal, we warned the Americans in Doha, in Kabul, in Washington, because I was part of a dialogue with the Taliban. And the only leverage was the withdrawal. We just, United States, just give it easily to the Taliban. So, on the opening, I think, no, as I mentioned earlier, the opening of embassies has to be connected to a condition, to a thing. Yeah. Otherwise, you just validate their point. You mentioned that you know, the, Trump, the, the point. Trump and Biden administration, you know, they, the Trump administration did the withdrawal deal with the Taliban, which kind of gave the Taliban everything they wanted, and the Biden administration went through with it. But obviously, they're not the only people political actors that made mistakes. And so how do you grade the, the Ghani administration? I mean, you were President Ghani's chief of staff. You were in the palace the day the Taliban took Kabul. What mistakes did the Afghan, did Afghan politicians make? Well, I mean, uh, that is uh, one of the main internal factor for the collapse. If I would highlight the mistakes we made, uh, um, President Ghani, his style of governance and politics, because he took or he understood or perceived the negotiation more personal. He thought the whole negotiation is to remove him from power. I took it more personal. The rivalry of uh, Ambassador Khalilzad and President Ghani in a way undermine the U.S. and Kabul relationship. That's one factor. And second, uh, President Ghani, because in 2020, I left the government. I was a member of negotiating team. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, he taught the whole this process is to oust him from power. Instead of he preparing for a a war without American support. He prepared for a scenario where there will be a deal. He's not there. He has to object it. So there, he brought a massive change in armed forces. Didn't allow the armed forces to have nurture its own leadership. So saying, because army was already, I mean, Taliban and also, because we had a stalemate. Both sides was tired of fighting. So saying a deal comes like that. If his interest is not included, the army might impose that on him. So he actively removed all the uh, our best commanders, best generals from the from the army corps, from brigade. From so a massive engineering happened in the army, in our intel service, in our police service, in our local governance. When after in April 2021, when President Biden announced a complete withdrawal, didn't stick. He was expecting Biden might change the policy of Trump, but no, he didn't. He went with the withdrawal, so everything crashed. So we had warned him in 2019, in July 2019, after a dialogue with the Taliban, we should not hold the presidential election because that is more, bring more uh, tension. tension domestically. The country is already facing an existential threat, and the peace process are going, so we need to be united. But he hold election was a major mistake, that presidential election, because no one participated, and it showed a shallow of the republic system, 
and the country became more divided. Uh, so I would say uh, we are as responsible as uh, here. Uh, so President Ghani and all of us are really responsible for that. I mean, kind of, he expedited the collapse of the republic. The republic could resist. The republic had resources. The republic had a better armed forces. So our, when, when this Doha deal was being negotiated, uh, we came with a, with a theory that this deal will not bring peace, but it's an opening for us. So we should prepare for a time when Americans will withdraw, then Taliban will, have a, will keep talking. Yeah. But the talk will not give any result. So because Taliban believe whether the American support will collapse. So whether the American support, we should be able to take the war in another stalemate. Then the real negotiation will start. So we didn't prepare for this scenario. You know, yeah. That was one of the We have time reasons. for maybe one question, if there is a question. Um, and if there, if there isn't, um, I will uh, thank Mateen Beck very, uh, for his insights. and. Uh, Let's hope that um, some people are listening to the, uh, to the ideas that you have uh, because I don't think the Taliban are going to be in power forever. I think embedded in their DNA, they're going to make some mistakes. They might start recruiting Europeans. You know, um, they might also engage in ethnic cleansing against the Hazaras, which they did in the past. Uh, they, uh, there might be attacks against an American target in the region. That be, you know, from traceable to Afghanistan. So things can change. And so anyway, thank you very much, sir. Thanks for that.